Well, right now I am at Pearl Harbor, uh, specifically Ford Island. And whenever a lot of people come to Pearl Harbor, understandably, a lot of focus gets put on, on the battleships, like the, the Arizona, and also the USS Missouri, which, which is here at Pearl Harbor. But whenever you're at Pearl Harbor, one thing that you have to remember is that this was an air raid. And you can't really talk about an air raid without talking about aviation, which is why I'm at this place today. This is the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, which is located in two of the original hangars here on Ford's Island. So uh, anyway, I, I looked on their website and there are some things here that you are not going to see anywhere else. We're gonna go ahead and dodge inside the museum and uh, see what we can learn a little bit, see what we can learn uh, about aviation here at Pearl Harbor. Well, this right here is Hangar 37, which now is one of the hangars that houses the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And take a look at this. This is on an active military base, so you have to take a shuttle to, to get here. And this is one of the first things that you are greeted with when you get off of the shuttle. These are some windows that were taken out of one of these hangars that still have bullet damage from the December 7th attacks. That is really something else. Uh, and also, before we go in, if you look across the parking lot here, you, you see this tower. Uh, this was the air traffic control tower um, in December of 1941. And uh, this was a water tower that was being converted to an air traffic control tower and they have just opened this up to the public to go up to the top. So uh, as soon as we're done here in this hangar, we're actually going to uh, go inside and uh, see if we can get a little bit different view of Pearl Harbor. But as for right now, we're gonna go ahead and go inside uh, hangar 37 here and uh, see what we can see. Whenever we walk into the museum here, we are first greeted by probably one of the most well-known aircraft of the Japanese, uh, and that is the, the Zero. This is a Mitsubishi A6 M2 Zero. Uh, so this was a, a fighter plane that was designed to take on other aircraft. Uh, it was really, a at, at, its, at the time, uh, superior to a, a lot of aircraft that the Americans had. Uh, it could fly faster, it was very maneuverable, it could fly further. Uh, the downside to it is that it had really, really light armor, so it, it could get shot up pretty easy. Uh, the, the Zeros had, if we look up here, had uh, 7.7 millimeter machine guns uh, that would be fired from behind the propeller. Of course, it would have the, the interrupter gear, uh, and then on its wings would have uh, two 20 millimeter cannons. But yeah, pretty awesome that uh, they have this here. The story of this particular aircraft is that it was recovered in the Solomon Islands and then uh, was restored to uh, condition where it could fly. Now, one of the bombers that took part in the attack on Pearl Harbor was the Nakajima Kate. Uh, this was a bomber that had a crew of three. You'd have a pilot, a radio operator, and a bombardier. And take a look at this. What you are looking at right here is one of two surviving examples of a Japanese Kate that exists in the world. 
uh, and this one is the most intact example. This one was discovered in the South Pacific and uh, had already been picked over by uh, souvenir hunters and the jungle had caused uh, a lot of damage, but it was recovered and brought right here. This is one of the only places on the planet where you can see one of these. So this was a, a carrier-based bomber. Uh, you can see the, the wings aren't damaged. They would actually fold up so that they could fit onto the carriers. But man, that is incredible that they actually have one of these here. Look at this. What we are looking at is a relic of the USS Arizona. So this is a section of the ship's uh, main deck framing that was removed from the, the galley porthole. So if we look right here, let me bring that into focus, that red circled portion is this section that we are looking at. So from this porthole, uh, sailors could have looked out and would have seen the, the USS Vestal, which was uh, just outside of the, uh, the Arizona when the attack occurred. Man, that is something else that they have this here. And if we come around to the other side, you can actually see like some of the stains where uh, the oil had leaked out. Wow. This is a pretty crazy story. So this Japanese airman is named Shigenori Nishikaichi, and he took part in the second wave attack on Pearl Harbor where his Zero was damaged. Uh, it had a puncture in the fuel tank. So he ended up flying his aircraft to the island of Niihau and uh, crash landed there. The civilians had dug trenches where in the landing area, and uh, anyway, there was a, a big incident that I'm not going to go fully into, but he, he tried to kind of, he took some prisoners there uh, on the island with the help of uh, this guy right here, uh, whose name was Yoshio Horada, and uh, who spoke Japanese. Uh, but he, he took some prisoners there, and then the, the prisoners ended up overpowering him and killing him. Uh, now before that, he'd went out and set fire to his airplane to keep any secrets from being taken by the Americans. And what we're looking at right here is some of the wreckage of that aircraft. So these are pieces of a Japanese Zero that actually took part in the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it's so cool to, to come to places like this museum and see these artifacts uh, not just for the sake of seeing the artifacts, but more for the, the story they tell. This is a story that has kind of flown under the radar. And this is one of the, the few times that you can see wreckage from an, an aircraft that actually took part in the Pearl Harbor attack. One thing that we can't forget here at Pearl Harbor is that uh, there were civilians who were caught up in this fight as well. Uh, like this guy, Roy Vitusek, and his son, who uh, really picked a bad morning to go up and do a little bit of joyriding in this plane right here. Uh, can you even imagine going up with your son to do a little bit of morning flying and sightseeing, and then all of a sudden, here comes hundreds of Japanese aircraft uh, shooting at anything uh, there around Pearl Harbor. Uh, they ended up safely landing and ran into the jungle and hid, but man, 
that is quite the story. And that is the actual aircraft, by the way. It's not a replica. That, that is the aircraft that went up on uh, the morning of December 7th. So also on display here at the museum, they have a twin engine B-25 Mitchell. I, I love these bombers. These are the bombers that were used on the Doolittle raid, which was uh, kind of like a, a retaliatory mission after Pearl Harbor to try and uh, really send a, a signal to the Japanese, but also to boost the morale of the U.S. And what's incredible is they stripped these things down and got them to the point where they could take off from an aircraft carrier. Uh, now this one uh, has, is, is really kind of uh, assembled from several different uh, B-25s, but it's been restored to uh, look like the ruptured duck, which was uh, plane number seven on the Doolittle Raid. Now here's one cool thing that you'll only get if you listen to the audio tour whenever you come through here. If you look right here, well, you'll see a couple of signatures. Well, there were a couple of Doolittle Raiders who visited this museum. One of them was Dick Cole from plane number one. He was the co-pilot for Jimmy Doolittle. And uh, the other one is Tom Griffin, who was the navigator in bomber number nine. Okay, we're seeing all kinds of cool things in this museum. Uh, including this plane right here. This is an F-4F Wildcat. And uh, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Enterprise uh, sent out uh, some of these Wildcats to, to try and search for the Japanese fleet. Uh, they, they were unable to find them. It was dark. They couldn't land back on the Enterprise. So they ended up coming back around to Pearl Harbor. And we'll, we'll talk about this more in another video, but there was an unfortunate incident where six of these planes were, were coming in and there, there was some confusion on the ground and some people who were uh, understandably uh, a, a little bit uh, on edge and they ended up firing on their own men and killed three of these pilots uh, on the evening of December 7th. But yeah, there's uh, an F4F Wildcat. Uh, one other thing that I probably should mention about the F-4F Wildcat. Uh, this aircraft was, um, how shall we say it, uh, less than awesome when compared to the other uh, enemy aircraft that it was going up against. Uh, a, a Zero could outrun this thing, it could outmaneuver it. So the, the men who piloted these aircraft were just absolute beasts. And uh, they had to kind of rely on, on teamwork and had to rely on outmaneuvering the enemy in order to survive and to hold the line. They had a thing called a, a thatch weave, uh, where if one aircraft got an enemy on its tail, well, they would fly towards each other to where the wingman could take out the, uh, the enemy that was tailing the other guy. But anyway, uh, the, these are the planes that, that kind of held the line until better aircraft could uh, could be brought to bear. Check this out. This is a Douglas SBD Dauntless. This is an American dive bomber. And something kind of funny, the men who piloted this plane uh, jokingly said that SBD stood for uh, slow but deadly. Uh, but there, there are a few things on this that, that I want to point out, a few features that really make it unique. One is this right here. These are called dive brakes. So whenever this plane would go into its dive run to drop its bomb, well, it would be a very, at a very steep angle. Well, to, to slow it down, they would deploy these dive brakes to keep it from going down too fast. And another thing, if we walk over here, if you look on the underside of the Dauntless, well, there's a swing arm where the, the bomb load would swing out so that it could avoid hitting the propeller. Because if your bomb hit the propeller or vice versa, well, that might be uh, just a little bit inconvenient. Uh, now, these were huge. Uh, in the Battle of Midway. This particular aircraft saw action in the Battle of Coral Sea. 
uh, and then was sent back to the United States and used as a trainer. It ended up crashing in Lake Michigan and uh, was recovered in the mid-2000s. And really just recently, uh, in the past year, made its way to where it sits right now at uh, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Very cool to see one of these. What we are looking at here is a Curtis P-40 Warhawk. Uh, sometimes you'll hear them called a, a Tomahawk as well, uh, usually by the British. Uh, these are the, the planes that were used by Claire Chenault's Flying Tigers in China by the American Volunteer Group. So it was a, a legendary group of pilots that uh, did a lot before the U.S. was even in the war. Where Pearl Harbor is concerned, well, this aircraft also has a story. Um, there were two guys by the name of Kenneth Taylor and George Welch who were, were pilots here at Pearl Harbor uh, and they commandeered a couple of Warhawks and started fighting back against the Japanese. As a matter of fact they landed and took off twice I believe if I'm not mistaken and uh, had six kills between the two of them. But uh, yeah the the work that was done by Welch and Taylor was out of one of these P-40 Warhawks. All right, uh, that was legitimately cool. And uh, now we've got a little bit of a, a rain situation going on now, but there are things in that hangar and in that museum that you simply are not going to see anywhere else in the world. Uh, so there's uh, another hangar here, that was 37, we're getting ready to go to 79, which has uh, a few more aircraft in it. And then we're going to go up in uh, this tower right here, which I'm told inside uh, offers a view of Pearl Harbor that you are simply not going to get anywhere else. This is Hangar 79, which serves as the other part of the museum here at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And on December 7th, uh, here at Fords Island, you, you're talking about being right in the eye of the storm. And this hangar bears witness to that. Take a look at this. Here on these windows, you can still see the bullet strikes from where a Japanese aircraft strafed this hangar. That is really something else. All right, we're gonna go inside and, and take a, a quick look at uh, one of the aircraft inside of this hangar. Well, here in Hangar 79, they have a B-17 on display with one heck of a story. And uh, if you'll notice, this thing looks a, a little worse for the wear. Well, the story behind this is uh, this B-17 was, was one of nine that was sent out to do a bombing raid on a Japanese fleet that was converging on New Britain. Long story short, there were weather problems, there were mechanical problems, and then uh, this particular B-17 had a whole bunch of Japanese fighters that were, were swarming it. It took some damage and ended up having to do a crash landing in New Guinea, which is a, a pretty uh, environmentally hostile place. Uh, they ended up setting down in a swamp. They thought it was a field. The whole crew survived, which is a testament to how well built these aircraft were. And uh, six weeks later, uh, they ended up in Port Mosby after making their way out of the swamp. Uh, so if we go over here, this is where they, they kind of tell the story uh, about this aircraft. Well, for the next several years, it just sat in this swamp. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the pilot of this aircraft, whenever he got a new plane, would fly over it and could see his crashed plane uh, you know, on a regular basis. And uh, later on, it got the nickname the, the Swamp Ghost. Well, in the mid-2000s, there was an effort to recover the Swamp Ghost. So using helicopters, they got this thing out a piece at a time. And then 
uh, it made its way finally after a long journey to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum very very cool and then they collaborated with Disney who uh, was responsible for you know a lot of artwork and inspiration for artwork during World War II on these planes and uh, yeah here's Disney's artwork for the Swamp Ghost <laughs> I love that story <laughs> man this place is just so stinking fascinating and for, for everything that I'm showing, there's a whole lot more that I'm not showing. Uh, there's, there's just too much, and this video would be like five hours long. Uh, but anyway, you have to come here for yourself and check it out. But for right now, we're going to go up here and uh, take a look in this tower. All right, so this building today serves as the operations building for the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. Uh, in 1941, this would have been a fire station, and this tower... Uh, would have been a water tower that was in the process of being converted over to an air traffic control tower. Now, if you look right here, that was the weather station and air traffic control tower uh, here on Ford Island on December 7th. And it was from this spot right here that the first message went out that there was an attack on Pearl Harbor. All right, so we're going to go inside and uh, head to the top. Okay, making our way to the top here, and <laughs> holy smokes. Yeah, this is a different view of Pearl Harbor. Seriously, look at this. This is a view right here that you are simply not going to get anywhere else in Pearl Harbor. So, so from right here, well, you can see all of where Battleship Row would have been. So, so right out at the far end would have been the Nevada. You can see the USS Arizona Memorial back there. Okay, you also would have had the, the West Virginia, and the Tennessee, and the other ships there on Battleship Row. And uh, I can't film too far to the right because that's the Naval Shipyard and they've asked me not to film that. But, but right here to the right is the Southeast Lock. So you can stand here and, and just imagine on the morning of December 7th these torpedo bombers coming in from this direction and just slamming into the sides of like the the Oklahoma and the the West Virginia and then having the dive bombers coming in and hitting those inboard ships okay and then if we we look back here okay well back here is where the the Utah would have been this is the area of Pearl Harbor where the carriers were supposed to be but uh, which were fortunately out to sea the morning that the Japanese came here to attack. But this view is absolutely incredible and gives you such a different perspective of the battle. Absolutely amazing. Okay, so I'm up here with uh, Dave, who is the marketing director here at the Pacific Aviation Museum. And this is a, a picture that was taken on the morning of December 7th. And right here, you look at this plume of water up in the sky uh, that is the West Virginia being hit and we are in this tower right here so if you compare the two this plume of water here you can see one of the Japanese zeros this is about three times the height of where we are standing right now so you can look out over the harbor and just imagine these torpedo bombers and dive bombers coming in the West Virginia would have been right out in this area and uh, yeah, having, having these plumes of water three times higher 
than where we are now. It, it just must have been absolute insanity here. I've moved over now to where we are looking to the south. So this is the, the south side of Ford Island and kind of the, the mouth of Pearl Harbor. And I mentioned in another video how the, the first strike of the Japanese was on the southern end of Pearl Harbor. Okay, so there was a hangar right there in December of 41, and that was the first place that the Japanese hit. Uh, there were some PBY Catalina uh, long-range reconnaissance aircraft there, and the Japanese wanted to, to take them out first. Uh, then also from here, it, it, I can't get over this, how much you can see from, from this angle. So right out here, kind of where that gray structure is, it's right around where the Pennsylvania was. So that was a battleship here in Pearl Harbor that was not in Battleship Row. Uh, right over here would have been where the Shaw was. There are some famous pictures of the, the Shaw uh, exploding as it was being hit by uh, Japanese bombers. And then of course, whenever the second wave came around, we have talked about the USS Nevada. Okay, so the Nevada would have been making its way right along through here, and they were trying to make it out to open water, and the, the Japanese just started swarming this battleship. As a matter of fact, if they could catch it right there in the mouth of the harbor and sink it, well, they could bottle up this whole thing. Well, right there on Hospital Point, uh, the Nevada ended up being beached uh, with the help of the USS Hoga, but this this is absolutely incredible okay so we've had a little bit of time to just kind of walk around this tower and and look over the the battlefield here and this this is unlike anything i i would have expected uh I, anybody who comes to pearl harbor needs to come here uh w one thing to think about is how high up we are dave how high is this Okay, okay, so we're 207 feet above sea level. The, the Japanese torpedo bombers were coming in at like around 40 feet. Okay, so everything that you're looking at right here, uh, people who would have, you know, maybe been in this tower, or if you would have been up this high, uh, you would have been looking down on these uh, Japanese bombers as they were just swarming this area. But yeah, definitely can get a better visualization of the battle up here than you can from anywhere else in Pearl Harbor. Well, uh, that was awesome. Uh, I know that I've already said this like 10 or 15 times now, but you're going to get a view of Pearl Harbor from this spot right here that you are not going to get anywhere else. Uh, now, the, the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum uh, is a, a nonprofit, so all of the, the money for tickets and everything like that goes right back into uh, preserving these places and, and improving them for, for the public and uh, educating people about what happened here at Pearl Harbor. But if you ever come to Pearl Harbor, come to this place. I, I am not kidding. Uh, it is an experience like no other and uh, will give you a perspective that, that you will not get anywhere else. We are constantly exploring and learning new things on this channel, so if you found value in this video, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to catch all of the new content when it comes out. And be sure to check the links in the description for more content and opportunities from our partners.